So let's take a look at the Triassic, Triassic uh, paleogeographic setup here. So here we can see that most of North America is actually pretty dry. But do remember that Africa is sitting off here and we have South America sitting right here as well. And of course that's going to restrict any water flow coming in from the east or the southeast. So really our water is going to come in right from the west and down from the north, right, as you can see. Um, so this really leaves most of the middle part of North America dry. So for the first time, we're really going to see some non-marine sequences, which we haven't seen before. Almost all of the Paleozoic North America was covered with water um, or swampy, right? So we're really going to see some, some firsts here in the Triassic. So we have to remember that during the beginning part of the Triassic, we have rifting, right? North America is rifting away from Africa, essentially, at this point in time. So remember, when things rift, right, and they pull apart, they're going to break. But remember, they don't break straight downwards. Essentially, we're going to see this rift develop, right, a rift valley. And of course, that rift valley is going to get deeper and deeper over time which is what we see here. Um, and it starts out in the Triassic, very um, not so deep, and then by the time we get to the Jurassic, we're gonna start to see igneous material come into these rift basins. So obviously these rift basins get deep pretty fast. Now what's pretty cool here, so here we are in the, in the early Triassic, you see we're starting to get these rift, these fault-bound rift basins here, and really we have two large basins that are forming. We have the Newark Basin and the Atlantic Basin, which of course the Atlantic Basin is what eventually opens up, right, and forms the Atlantic Ocean. And the Newark Basin is basically a failed rift. So the rift just kind of stopped once the Atlantic opened, the pressure was off and that just kept opening. The Newark Basin just kind of stopped. So it, it created this big basin and that's what catches a lot of the eroded material. Remember we have mountains over here. So that material erodes off and essentially gets deposited in that basin. And of course, you're going to have lots of water in that basin as well. And it makes this rock uh, group we call the Newark Supergroup. So in the Newark Basin, we're going to see alluvial fans, which remember is basically the delta that forms at the base of the mountains, right? That catches all of that material. Um, we're going to see lots of rivers and floodplains as they flow across that low material, or that low part in the basin. We're going to have lots of lakes and lots of deserts as well, um, which really sets the, a prime spot here for lots of dinosaur trackways. So as you have lots of river environments, of course, dinosaurs are going to go towards the river, and we have lots and lots of trackways from this time. But what's really exciting is we have some non-marine deposits um, that we can find in North America. So these are not ocean influenced at all. These are all uh, land environments, which we haven't seen before. So let's start um, in the Triassic down here. We'll start with the Menkepi Formation. The Monkepi, the Monkepi Formation is basically a river environment where we see um, silt and shale, this big alluvial plain, okay, and this big river that's just kind of meandering across this large alluvial plain. That's gonna be your Menkepi. As we move up in time, we have the Shinnerump, which is a conglomerate. So that's a gravel, for those of you that haven't taken 101. So this means that this is a faster-moving river. Um, remember, the faster water moves, the bigger grains it can pick up, pick up. So as we have a conglomerate there, that's telling us that this is a faster river environment. Then we're going to end the Triassic with the Chinle. And the Chinle kind of goes back to what we saw in the Menkepi, um, where we have this meandering river environment. But this river environment is going to have volcanic ash in it, um, which you can see that the ash that's going to come in from both the west, um, as we're going to talk about some of those, the, the first orogeny out there. And then, of course, don't forget you have um, the Atlantic Basin opening up as well. Now, as we move into the Jurassic, things dry out. We have the Wingate Sandstone, which is just a very large dune environment um, that's sitting there. Then things get a little bit wetter, and we have a stream uh, environment, which is the Kayenta Formation, which the Kayenta has tons of dinosaur trackways all over it. Um, again, showing you this nice fluvial environment. 
And this is all topped off with the Navajo sandstone, which are humongous dunes, um, basically Saharan-sized dunes um, that form at this point. Now, what's actually really impressive is on top of the Navajo sandstone, we have limestone, which remember, limestone forms in coral reef environments. So this should really impress you at how much and how fast the climate changes if we go from large Saharan-sized dunes to limestone. That is a huge, huge change. So if we want to see some examples of some of these rocks here, uh, if we want to take a look at the Chinle Formation, we can go to uh, Petrified Forest, which here we have my kid for scale from a very long time ago. Um, but you see we have this really large tree here. So this tree uh, fell into the, that meandering river. And because there was a lot of volcanic ash in the water, that volcanic ash had a lot of quartz. And as it works its way through the wood, essentially the quartz replaces the organic material in the wood, and it slowly turns the wood to stone, right? So producing these uh, petrified trees, right? So basically they're just, they're there forever now. They're, they've turned to quartz. If you want to see the Navajo sandstone, you can go to Zion National Park here, which everyone should go to Zion. It's quite incredible. Um, so first, to give you a sense of scale, these are large pine trees down here. And as you kind of take a look at this, you might notice that there's a, basically a lot of triangles. Here you see a triangle with a flat top. Right here you see uh, another one and another one and another one. Right, They're all over the place. These are dunes. Right, Remember I told you the Navajo sandstone is basically these large um, Saharan-sized dunes right, that you can see. Oops, sorry about that. These large Saharan-sized dunes. Um, and they're just full of these huge cross-budded environments. So if you ever get a chance to go to Zion, uh, definitely go because the sheer size of these dunes is really, really incredible. And it kind of gives you this awesome glimpse of walking back into time and, and feeling what it would have been like, right, in the late, uh, or in the, um, you know, Jurassic time period. So what's really important to remember is that plate tectonics ties everything together. So if we remember over here in the east, we have rifting going on. So North America's moving this way, Africa's rifting off. Okay, so we have divergence. If we're creating new crust in one place, we have to be destroying it somewhere else. So we have rifting happening on the east coast and we have subduction happening on the west coast okay so we have to remember that when rifting when seafloor spreading is happening the fastest in the atlantic we're going to see lots of subduction and more tectonic activity in the west so the faster things spread the faster things subduct so it's really really important to remember that these are tied to each other so as this plate is going to subduct, remember we have Panalassa, which is this huge ocean. Panalassa is not one big ocean plate. It's made up of multiple ocean plates, which those ocean plates are colliding with each other and creating large volcanic arcs all over the place. So as these plates subduct underneath North America, it's going to bring in lots of island arcs, microcontinents, these things we call alloxanous terrains, which are... are pieces of crust that have been transported from a far away. And they're going to come in and they're going to collide with the western part of North America. And this is really what's going to generate the Cordillera, everything going from the western part of California all the way into the Rocky Mountains in Denver. So we see our first orogeny of the Mesozoic occur. So remember, the Appalachians are done forming at this point. They're not going to form anymore. They're only actually going to erode. So if we look at the Cordillera, we've actually already seen our first orogeny. Remember that occurred in the Paleozoic. That was the antler. And in the Mesozoic, we're going to see four more orogenies occur. So this next one is the Sonoma. And the Sonoma orogeny, remember, we have these large island arcs that are out there. I know this picture is a cross-section, so it just looks like one volcano. But remember, it's a whole line of volcanoes, right, that are approaching the western edge of North America. So as this line of volcanoes comes in and collides, it collides in with such force, well, this should really impress you, that 
the sea floor that was sitting here in between North America and the island arc, instead of getting subducted, it gets crunched and tossed up onto the continent. We call that abduction. So you can actually see the ophiolite sequence, the ocean floor sitting on top of North America. This is how we knew what the ocean floor looked like long before we had the ability to go down to the ocean floor. 